Welcome to the Augustine Institute show. This evening, we're going to talk about the historical case for Jesus. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm a strong believer. Why do we, what do you mean a historical case for Jesus? History is really important to Christianity and to Judaism. In fact, without history, we would simply be an idea. Christianity would be an idea. It would be kind of like Gnosticism, I guess, or a myth. But what makes history so important for Christianity is that Christianity is about what God has done in time. God enters into the world and into human history, and he has done amazing things. And so the idea of the gospel, the good news, it's about the good news about what God has done in our world to save our world. It's not simply good advice, it's good news about an event. And that's what we're gonna to explore tonight. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to have um, my dear friend, Dr. Brant Petrie as our guest tonight. We're gonna to talk and explore the historical case for Jesus. And Dr. Petrie has written a wonderful book called The Case for Jesus. And uh, it's a wonderful book that goes into the historical questions that modern scholarship for the last 200 years, really since the enlightenment, has had regarding Jesus Christ and Christianity. And so we're gonna look at some of these tough questions and issues. And we're gonna see that the more we study history, the stronger your faith can be. I really firmly believe that. I know Dr. Petrie does as well. So Brant, it's a joy to have you on the show. Thanks, Tim. It's great to be here. Yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of people think, well, if we're going to get into history and scholarship, and this is going to be something that's going to get us away from the heart of Jesus or the meaning of Jesus. But in, in your own life, you've dedicated your life to studying. Mm -hmm. uh, you did your doctoral studies on Jesus. As you got deeper into history, it led to deeper faith, didn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that that, uh, that kind of reservation about the study of history uh, flows from a few things. First of all, it's hard. It's hard work. Um, there's lots of information, lots of books to read, lots of ancient writers to study. Um, but also, too, I think sometimes it flows from a misconception of faith, right? Like a friend of mine once was teaching a catechism class, and he asked the students, you know, what is faith? And one of the kids said, well, faith is when you believe something, even when you know it isn't true. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, so painful, yes. <laughs> no, that's not what faith is. No, faith is our act of trust and our assent to what God has done and what God has revealed in time, in space, and in human history. So it, it is an act of the intellect and the will that doesn't go against reason, yeah. but actually flows from and is a consonant with his uh, formed by our, our rational faculties, right? It, it, it fits and works with God making us not just uh, to have hearts, but also to have minds. And so um, in my own journey uh, over the years, I grew up, I'm cradle Catholic, um, and uh, came from a, a practicing devout family. But when I went off to college, what happened was I started to ha uh, study uh, classes on the New Testament, Old Testament, and hear questions about the origins of the Bible or the origins of the gospel or the divinity of Jesus mm -hmm. that no one had ever raised when I was growing up as a believing Catholic. And Things I think so many people experience that when they go off to college. Uh, They'll yes. hear that here they are at a university, yep. really smart people, all Very these smart. professors with doctorates, and they're raising serious questions. Serious questions. You know, can we really trust the gospels? You know, right. was it the church inventing these ideas? Did Jesus actually claim to be God, right? Or is yeah. that just a, a myth? Is that just an idea? Um, which is a, that's a serious question that deserves a serious answer. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, I knew from growing up a Christian, growing up a Catholic, that the Christian faith makes a historical claim. It isn't just an idea. It isn't just a set of like rules and regulations, a kind of code of morality. Christianity is fundamentally a historical religion because it claims that the God of the universe became a man in a certain time, in a certain place, in a little village in Nazareth. And so uh, that historical matrix of what we believe uh, when we ask serious questions about that, they deserve serious answers. You know, when we talk about history like this, Brant, it reminds me of the whole idea of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Did God really become man? And the incarnation yeah. is the idea that God became man in time. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Every Christmas. And so that God enters into history when he becomes incarnate. Absolutely. And so 
And it, it, in my own experience, when that idea was challenged, so for mm -hmm. example, the, the story I tell in the book is, uh, in my first class on the New Testament, I was an undergraduate, the professor came in, I think it was the first day, he said, I know what you believed all your life about the Gospels, you know, the Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I know that's what it says in your Bibles, and that what you, that's what you hear at church. But I'm here to tell you that scholars today know that the Gospels were originally anonymous, mm -hmm. and that none of them are written by, written by eyewitnesses, and that we can't really know if what they say about Jesus, what he did and what he said, is actually historically true, or if it's just more mythological, more like folklore. And for me as a cradle Catholic, that really rocked me. Wow, it rocked yeah. my faith because if Jesus didn't claim to be God, and if the Gospels aren't reliable, truthful accounts of what he said and he did, then why would I be a Catholic? Right, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. we're going to get to the answer to that question yeah, sure, in, sure, in sure. a minute. But I just want to invite everybody to join the, our conversation. We, you know, we have these live shows that you can ask, ask questions that we can uh, field and have a dialogue with you. So please you know, text in your questions. Use our text line, which is 720-650-0100. So you can text in a question. Just let us know, you know uh, if you're Linda from Phoenix or you're Mark from Ontario, Canada. Uh, just put your name, where you're from, or what country. We, we have a lot of people from all over the world, so we love having you as part of the conversation. So please do that. Or you can also leave a, a comment in our comment section. You can put questions there on the form platform. So if you're watching on Formed, yeah. you could type into the, to the comment section and leave your, your questions. And so if you have any questions about history, and Jesus, that you know, maybe all the way back to your freshman year of college, maybe <laughs> your college days, or you're watching, you know, the History Channel, and yeah. somebody, you know, maybe there was Bart Ehrman or somebody uh, being interviewed, and in one yeah. of these modern scholars, who was skeptical and uh, had those questions. Well, one of those skeptical questions people have, as you mentioned, Brent, is, you know, th these gospels were just anonymous and passed on, yeah. and I love how you tackle that as one of the first topics of this book. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you give people the, the brief answer to that? Yeah. So the, the the short short version of the issue is this: is that um, in the mid 20th and late 20th century, the theory arose and became very widespread that originally the four gospels in our New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, were anonymous and that they did not have any titles, and they weren't ascribed to apostles like Matthew or John. Right, or, so just to give people yeah. a, a sense of that, so it says, that, you know, the gospel according to Mark, or the gospel according to Matthew, and the hypothesis was that was added on later on That's exactly to right. give it authority, but it wasn't there originally, and they just kind of were passed around anonymously. In other words, there was no name to validate the book. That's exactly right. So the theory says originally they were written and published by we don't know who, okay? And then they circulated for almost 100 years without any titles. And then in the late second century, the church began adding names to the Gospels in order to give them authority so that people would believe that they were written by eyewitnesses like Matthew or John, who were both members of the Twelve. And that's really the rub, isn't it? Because if it wasn't done by people who had a name, you, you lose the eyewitness testimony, and then you lose the sense of credibility. That's exactly right. And proximity to the event, right? Because it, an eyewitness is going to be closer to the event than some anonymous person writing who knows where and who knows when. So when I went off to college and first encountered that idea that all of the Gospels were originally anonymous and the titles were only added later, I was just an undergraduate. I didn't know anything. So I'm just taking notes like the Gospels originally anonymous, check, check. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a little odd. I hadn't heard that before. But over time, it was... It, it, it was kind of like a crack. You ever get a crack in your windshield oh, in your car? Oh, yeah, it starts to grow. And yeah, so it starts off small, just a little, mm. a little doubt or a little uncertainty, mm -hmm. and then it, starts, it spreads throughout the whole windshield, and pretty soon you can't see, right? You yeah. can't see where you're going. And that's really what happened to me, personally. Um, accepting that theory of the Gospels not being eyewitness testimony then raises the question, well, what in them is true and what isn't? And how do we really know what Jesus did and what Jesus said? And so it ushers you into a kind of skeptical attitude, yeah. which eventually led me to even wonder with a lot of scholars today, well, did Jesus actually ever even claim to be God? And that, that was really the question that hit me hard. That's a big one that yeah. I want to come back to yeah, in sure. a minute. But, but I love your response to this because it's oh, very, sure. very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, and it's very historical. Yep. The historical answer to the idea that these gospels weren't anonymous that they is what is what for people. It's to go and look <laughs> at the manuscript. The actual evidence. manuscripts. Yeah. Okay. So right, even to this day, if you want to tell how how do you know someone wrote a book, there's two ways to tell. 
what scholars call external evidence and, and internal evidence. So internal evidence is just look in the book and see who wrote it. Like my book says, <laughs> Brand Petrie wrote the book, right? So right. That's, I'm on the first page, that's internal evidence. External evidence for finding out who wrote a book is to ask people who knew the author or who lived at the same time as the author, hey, did this person write that book? Like, so you could ask Pope Benedict's brother, you know, did he write a book on Jesus of Nazareth? Yes, he did, right? So it corroborates the internal evidence. So what I started doing was looking at the internal evidence of ancient Greek manuscripts and external evidence from ancient Christian writers who were alive either at the time of the apostles or shortly thereafter. And the, what I discovered was, this blew me away, there are no anonymous manuscripts. Because I was expecting, well, surely if they were all anonymous to begin with, and if I'm acting like a yeah. historian and looking for evidence, yeah. then there should be plenty of anonymous copies, yeah. right? But when I started doing what scholars called text criticism, which is studying yeah. the actual original Greek manuscripts mm -hmm. and looking at the text in its original language, um, I kept looking for those copies. And guess what, Tim? Didn't find them. <laughs> there's not just, a, there's, are there a few? No, there's zero, zero, right? And not just for one of the gospels, but for all four. So, yeah. I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah. Like, it, it, yeah. there are no anonymous copies of Matthew, no anonymous copies of Luke, no anonymous copies so there's, of So there's not a single copy of the gospel of Matthew that doesn't say according to Matthew. Right. Yeah, there's certainly not a, not a gospel compl that's complete. I mean, that's obviously complete. there's fragments. Yeah, there'll be fr that's what I was going to say. There but, are sometimes that, fragments. But at the start of the first page, yep. we don't have a first page of a gospel that doesn't say according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That's right. So it, it's amazing that this kind of theory gets spun up without evidence, right. and it becomes factual for the academic world. Yeah, well, and it's not everyone in the academic world, but I would say it's the majority position. At least it was when I was in school in the late 90s, right? Yeah. It is It is. There are some, some changing voices and challenges have been raised to it. But it, it was one of those things where first I looked at that data, then I started reading the church fathers, and this was the end. So once I started reading these ancient Christian writers, I expected them. These are people like Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus of Lyon. These are people who were disciples of men who were disciples of the apostles. They're one, two generations removed from the life of the apostles. And what I discovered was... I expected them to be as agnostic or skeptical about who wrote the Gospels as some of my professors or the books I was reading were. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered was not only are the manuscripts unanimous in attributing these books to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but so is the external evidence from the Father. So the internal evidence and the external evidence all align. All align. It yeah. was completely unanimous on and so let's just go back to that moment. As you begin to realize this more and more, yeah. you go back to when you were in college student, yeah. you're, you're, you got that crack growing in the windshield, yeah, sure, sure, sure. that crack of doubt, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When does that crack just go away? Because all of a sudden you realize, no, actually all the manuscript evidence, which is not just yeah. hundreds, but ultimately yeah. thousands of manuscripts, yeah, thousands of manuscripts in that all consistently point to this and all the outside evidence of the church fathers are all corroborating this. And so all of a sudden, the church's position on this is actually confirmed by history. That's exactly right. And did you, so you walk away with a deeper sense of faith. Absolutely, because it helped me arrive at a faith that wasn't believing something even when I knew it wasn't true, mm. but a faith that was supernatural to be sure, a gift, yep. but also grounded in reason yeah. and, and um, coherent with reason. It was a reasonable faith. You know, when you say that, it reminds me of Pope Benedict Emeritus who always talked about faith and reason yes. as two wings. And I think this is one of the geniuses of Catholicism is we believe that faith and reason belong together. They're not, there's exactly. not a tension. Like the more you try to do study and reason, yeah. it doesn't mean you're undermining faith. Yeah. That's important for people to understand. Absolutely. It, it, history is not a threat to the mm -hmm. Christian faith. It actually bolsters the case. But and that's just, what I try to show in the book. And it's just superficial history, a little bit of knowledge. Well, that's the thing. A that little can be bit dangerous, of, right? A little bit of knowledge mixed with a little bit of error, too. Yeah. Or bad logic, bad philosophy, yeah. bad arguments, right, yeah. uh, can, can be very destructive and very yeah. dangerous and, and very misleading. And so for me, the moment was really when I started reading the fathers, the church fathers. Mm. That was a pivotal moment mm. because I thought, wait a second, if all of the most ancient Christian writers and by the way, these are ancient Christians writing in Gaul, which is France, Africa, North Africa, Carthage. They're writing in Egypt, Alexandria. They're writing in Palestine. So they're spread out throughout the world. So there's a geographical spread mm -hmm. as well. How are they all agreeing 
yeah. about the authorship of these gospels if the titles weren't added 200 years later. It's an implausible scenario to imagine, which is what scholars will say sometimes, that after 100 years, scribes all around the Roman Empire just miraculously attributed the exact same titles to the same books. No, if the, they were originally anonymous, we would expect discrepancies and divergences in who the books are being attributed to, but that's exactly what we don't find. We get a question from uh, Tim in Scottsdale, Arizona, who asks, you know, what's the f historical facts that Jesus actually lived, that he existed? What, what would be some of the bigger facts that we could prove historically? Like historical evidence proving his existence? Yep. Okay, um, the first one would be the existence of the Gospels themselves. Yeah. Because what we have in the four Gospels is four ancient biographies written either by students of Jesus or by the disciples of his students. So Mark is a student, a disciple of Peter, and Luke is a disciple of Paul, although Paul's once removed. But um, mm -hmm. they're all written within the living memory of the historical figure in question, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, that is better evidence we have for almost any other historical figure from that time period. Yeah. And I, I usually illustrate this to my students by an example. If you compare Alexander the Great, for example, right? Yeah. We have several, we have four or five biographies of Alexander the Great, whether it's in Plutarch's lives or Suetonius' lives of the Caesars, right? But those biographies are written 200, 300, 150 years after Alexander the Great lived. Lived, and no one's doubting with and, great skepticism and, and, and those classical accounts. classical historians do every day. They write books on Alexander the Great without doubting the substance of those biographical accounts of Alexander the Great. No one's going around saying the myth of Alexander. He didn't really <laughs> exist. But the biographical and historical evidence for Alexander the Great is nowhere near as chronologically close to the figure as the four biographies of Jesus that we have in the New Testament. Uh, so that's the first thing. I would just point to the Gospels. The yep. second thing would be Josephus, who a uh, first century Jewish historian, who also mentions Jesus of Nazareth in his Antiquity of the Jews. So we have an extra biblical, non-Christian witness. So any other figure of history, that kind of historical data, those, that kind of historical evidence, would be yeah. in irre considered irrefutable proof of their existence. Yeah. Ben asks uh, a question, how do we know um, that the Gospels are eyewitness testimony? Oh, what, that's what a great um, that's a great question. Uh, well, two of them aren't in the sense that they aren't direct eyewitness uh, testimony. For example, Luke, at the very beginning of his Gospel, uh, makes very clear that he's basing his gospel on the testimony of eyewitnesses, but he himself is not an eyewitness. And then Mark, we have no evidence that he was a follower of Jesus, but that he was a follower of Peter, right? Um, so what I would say is only two of the gospels claim to be direct eyewitness testimony. That's the gospel of Matthew yep. and the gospel of John. So for example, in John chapter 19, verse 35, and then John 21, 24, the author of the gospel, the beloved disciple, actually makes clear, he yeah. says, you know, he who saw this bears witness that he tells the truth, talking about and the his crucifixion. Testimony is true. And yeah. his testimony is true, that's right. He uses the Jewish language of testimonia, like witness, bearing true witness. Yeah. That's a very serious uh, claim. And then at the end of the book, uh, in John 21, 24, it says, he who, uh, he who, uh, I forget, let me get the exact verse, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. I know, just to point this out, at the very end of John 21, 24, uh, yeah. after there's this exchange between Peter and John, the beloved disciple, it says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the book ends by telling you it's being written by the beloved disciple who was with Jesus at the Last Supper and throughout his ministry as an eyewitness and student. And this idea of eyewitness relating to history was really important for the ancient Greeks and Romans. Very important. Very important. If you look at other biographies, for example, Josephus, the Jewish historian, wrote a biography of himself, an autobiography. Yeah. Uh, Demonax, uh, who was the, the student of a philo the life of Demonax, he was a philosopher, and then one of his students wrote a biography of him. If you could show that you knew the person you were writing the biography about, it would establish the veracity and the plausibility, the credibility the of credibility. the account. And so the gospel writers, when they are eyewitnesses like John, will sometimes point that out. But then when they aren't, Luke tells you at the very beginning of his book in chapter one, verses one through four, that he's basing his gospel on the testimony of autopsy in yeah. Greek. Which uh, we get the word autopsy We get from. the word autopsy because an autopsy is a doctor who has seen for himself. He's examined himself you know, the causes and, of death. Yep. So that Greek word, autopti, Luke tells us, 
I'm not an eyewitness, but this gospel is based on eyewitness testimony. So Luke 1 and John 20, uh, 21 are two key places to show that the gospels claim to be eyewitness testimony themselves. So important. Well, Anna asks a really good question. She says, you know, we have the four gospels, uh, but sometimes the words of Jesus are different in different gospels. Yeah, good. So good. does that, you know, how, how do we know what he really said? Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I like that question. Wonderful question. Yeah, because we have to read the Gospels according to the standards of ancient biography. So on the one hand, they are biographies. Uh, there was an ancient Greek category known as a bios, a life of some famous figure. Yep. Usually be about a philosopher or a king, which of course Jesus is both, right? Yeah, he's the great right. wise man. Yep. He's the new Solomon and he's the new David, right? Yep. Um, but um, when it comes to uh, the... I'm, I'm trying to put this out. I'm trying to think of how exactly to answer this. Give, well, uh, you know, uh, let me put it this way. You know, it's not like history has to be a, a tape a recorder. I, that, oh, right. Yes. The, okay. So you don't have to have a tape recorder to say this is exactly what he said. Now, he was an itinerant preacher. And so sometimes he's going to say maybe the Beatitudes one way. Then he goes to another village and he's going to give a shorter list because the weather's bad. Yeah. The crowd's good. hungry. Sorry, my ball got lost so in that's the weeds right, there. That's all right. So, uh, so, uh, no, this is important, though. No. Yeah, so there are two ways to explain the differences between the Gospels. The first is genre. Just remember that when ancient writers wrote biographies, they were not attempting, as a rule, to give what we would consider like a verbatim transcript. It's not like a court stenographer sitting there and typing down every word exactly. You can see this. Uh, the best example I would point her to is the accounts of the Last Supper. Because in the accounts of the Last Supper, in Mark... That's good, because uh, Betty had a question about that. Oh, so good. So go in Matthew 26, Mark 14, here. Luke 22, you got a, accounts of one event where Jesus speaks one time. And the words are not in the same order. They're not verbatim. They're not a verbatim transcript. But they give us the substance, this is so important, of what Jesus said. Right? And that's how ancient biographies were. They would attempt to give the substance of what a person said. Now, um, on some occasions, like the Last Supper, you're going to have slight differences, but the meaning's the same. On other occasions, you can explain the differences in the way you just said. When you've got an itinerant preacher going all around, Jesus isn't making up new material every time he goes <laughs> to a new town. Comedians will know this, yep. uh, but also yep. professors know exactly. this, right? You don't always start yeah. from scratch. And with different audiences, you'll use different words. You'll use different uh, forms, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but and the then, substance. And then you recycle and things. And you recycle And things. sometimes you recycle and say it differently. So what he says in one gospel, a saying, yeah. he might have actually said that in Capernaum, and then in, in Jerusalem, he might have changed to the wording a little That's bit. That's exactly right, depending on who his audience is. Every good teacher yeah. will adapt his teaching to the audience. So those are just two ways. Uh, Pope Benedict actually mentions this in his book. He, he actually says we have to remember that although the gospels aren't transcripts, they give us the substance of what Jesus said, and they tell us the truth, right? Because you or I, we could recount this, what happened in this interview, we could recount it tomorrow to two different people. Are we right. gonna use the exact same words? Right. No, but that doesn't mean we're not telling the truth, right? We often summarize, recharacterize, use different words in human discourse, in oral discourse. That's just a natural thing. Would it be true, would this be correct, uh, Brant, to say that, you know, because people like to say, well, our idea of history is much different than the ancient idea of history, and so, would it be correct to say, well, yes, maybe in terms of chronology, we're, we're, we're kind of with the order of which what was said and what was done, right, but, yeah, yeah. but they cared that it actually was said that's, and it was actually done. That's very important. So that's, like a, that's another one of those dangerous half-truths, right? So on the one hand, modern history and ancient history are very different. For example, we tend to aim for exactitude down to the precise day and minute. So if you read a biography of Abraham Lincoln, it'll be a thousand pages telling exactly what minute he was born because we have access to lots of data and details. Ancients tended to be more general and shorter in their biographies. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't aiming for the truth. In fact, in the case for Jesus, I have a quote from Lucian, a famous ancient uh, historian who actually wrote a book called How to Write History, right? Yeah. It's from the same time as the Gospels. And what does Lucian say? That the aim of the ancient historian of his day is to say, is to tell the truth of what happened. Yeah. And that's what history is about. It's about events. So it's, ancient historians cared about they cared about that history was historical. That's exactly right. In fact, <laughs> Josephus, the Jewish historian, yep. he goes after other historians of the Jewish war mm. because they were giving false accounts, and he said, I'm going to tell you the truth yeah. of what happened because I'm writing historia in Greek, like history. That, so that, that part of the concept of history And, and is we even the same. find the term mythology used in the epistles. 
That's uh, true. And to differentiate what the Christians are That's doing. Exactly right. Mythology was something, it's meaningful, but it's not historical. That's exactly right. And for Christianity, it's meaningful and it's historical. I, I, I always point to this. I have lots of friends who love J.R.R. Tolkien, right? And mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis and Tolkien both came up with a modern literary category of true myth. Or they would use the word myth in a kind of elastic sense to talk about stories that have deep truths to them. And that's beautiful and good in the modern period, and I love Lewis and Tolkien. But that's not what the word muthos meant right. when the New Testament writers meant it, exactly. used it. So in First Peter yep. or Second Peter, yep. you know, when that word occurs, and also some of the Pauline letters, it means something that is false and not historically true. Yeah. So that's where we get that meaning of the term mythism. So they're very different concepts. They knew what history was. And the gospel writers, especially Luke, is, are making very clear that you know that, that that's what they're writing in their, in their books. Great. We've had some great questions submitted, but this one I, I want to tackle here. Uh -oh. and this okay. is a bigger one. But, now I'm nervous. So a viewer says they're sitting with a friend right now, okay. who, and their friend believes that Jesus was a, a real historical figure, okay. a real man, but not that he was God incarnate. Hmm. So what would you say to him? He's, he's watching right now. Okay. No this, pressure. No, no, it's a great question. So first I would say, well, let's look at the gospels and ask, well, who did he claim to be? Mm -hmm. So you might not think he was God, but mm -hmm. the historical evidence supports the fact that he did claim to be God. Yeah. And one of the things I show in the book, that's one of the main burdens of the book, is to show that Jesus claims to be divine in all four biographies that we have of him from the first century, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But he does it in a very Jewish way. Yeah. Right. So you can see very, really explicit examples of this, like in John chapter eight, when Jesus says, um, before Abraham was, I, I am. am. And I am, ego e me in Greek, is the Greek, yeah, yeah, it's, sure, yeah, it's yeah. the Greek phrase from the book of Exodus, where it's God reveals his name to yeah. Moses, right? God yeah. says, my name is I am, he who yeah. is, right? Yeah. Tell them I am have sent you to them, so, uh, sent you to them. So. When Jesus says, before Abraham existed, I am, when he's only 30 years old, yeah. in a Jewish context, he's making a divine claim. claim. Same thing in the Gospel of Mark, uh, when Jesus is uh, standing before Caiaphas. Mm -hmm. And Caiaphas says, tell us, are you the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am, and you'll see the son of man seated at the right hand of God and coming with the clouds of heaven. How does Caiaphas respond? He tie, tears his garments and says, this man has blasphemed. Now, a lot of Christians don't realize it wasn't blasphemy to claim to be the Messiah. All the Messiah right. was was the anointed right. king of Israel. But it was blasphemy yeah. to claim to sit at the right hand of God because to sit on the right hand of God means you're equal with God. And to come on the clouds was something any Jew would have known in the Old Testament. Yep, Who the, comes on the clouds of heaven? Theophany, that's a, it's a revelation of God. It's a revelation of God. Yeah. So the question I would pose to this person is, if Jesus of Nazareth claimed to be God, then you only have three options to respond to him. Either, number one, he was a liar. In other words, he yeah. knew he wasn't God, but he claimed to be God. And if you read through the Gospels, Jesus does not come across as a liar, right. okay? Second. Second is that he's a lunatic. In other words, he's somebody who thinks he's God, but he actually isn't God, okay? Yeah, and that's so inconsistent with the genius that we find in Jesus' teaching and yeah. deeds throughout, right? Jesus is not a madman, which by the way, that, I mean, that's the highest possible madness you can have, to think that you're a deity when yeah. in fact you're just a man. And then the third option, this is all you have left. If he's not a liar, if you don't think Jesus is a liar, and you don't think he's a crazy man, if you don't think he's a lunatic, then the only option left is that he is the Lord. Yeah. He is who he claimed to be. He didn't leave you any other options. You know, I, I, and I, I just want to say, too, because I know we're running short on time here, is my favorite chapter of your book, Brandon, is the, the case for Jesus' divinity that you have in oh, here. Thanks. I thought it was a, it's a fabulous thing because it's, it's, and I know you even say this is kind of the heart of the book when yeah. you get to that part. And so many people haven't heard that the historical Jesus would actually claim to be God. And uh, that's, that's a lot of confusion out there. I think also in episode six, I think it was in the search, we interviewed you yeah, that's right, yeah. and talk about Jesus and talk about the case for Jesus a bit and his divinity. Mm -hmm. And so I recommend we have the search on formed. Watch episode six of the search. It's really compelling case for that. And, uh, and I, and I, I want to just recommend for everybody out there and for this viewer who's, who's debating the case for Jesus, I'm glad you're watching and, and discerning this, the case for Jesus. Pick up Brant's book. And what we want to do, I, I, think that, I feel like this is such an important book. Anybody who wants to uh, donate to the Augustine Institute, whether join our mission circle, our monthly giving society, or a one-time donation, but if you join the mission circle, we'll send you a free copy 
uh, of Brandt's book, The Case for Jesus. I want to get this in the hands. And if you just simply want to buy it, we have it on catholic.market. You can find it there, uh, catholic.market, uh, The Case for Jesus. We also have Alexio Bible Study on form. So if you're like, this time has gone by too fast, yeah. <laughs> you can watch the videos that we have. We have a whole set of videos of Dr. Petrie going through this, and I think eight or ten episodes. Yeah, eight episodes. Eight yeah. episodes yeah. in detail. And we have a workbook for small groups to do a Bible study on the case for Jesus. So I hope you can join us for that and take advantage of that, uh, because it's it, the more you understand history, the more your faith is going to grow stronger with deeper conviction, deeper confidence. Yeah. And then you're going to have the competency to share the reasons for the faith. And so that's what's so important. So, Brian, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. It's are we a, done already? This we, is we are done. That I can't believe the time has gone by, but we're going to get you back yeah. on again okay. soon. That would be great. And, uh, and we want to thank everybody for joining us. And anybody who wants to join our Mission Circle, help us have these programs. We're deeply grateful for your support on the Mission Circle. For just $10 or more a month, you can become a Mission Circle partner with us. And we do a lot of special things, like have our professors, like Dr. Brian Petrie, who's one of our professors here at the Augusta Institute, speak directly to the Mission Circle members. So we'll have to set that up soon for, as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and may the Lord bless and keep you. Thank you.